welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian O'Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Landed Sirota, Senior Lecturer at the Auckland University of Technology Law School. We will discuss his work on Canadian constitutional law. So welcome to the show, Landed. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be here. Yeah, so I really enjoyed reading the range of really interesting and provocative papers that you sent, especially because despite having you know done several interviews with Canadian legal scholars uh, in recent months, my knowledge of Canadian constitutional law is is still pretty limited, and I felt like it expanded dramatically <laughs> while Thanks. while reading while, <laughs> while reading your work. Um, but for listeners who may not have yet had that experience, I, I wonder if we could start by just kind of talking a little bit about what Canadian constitutional law looks like. So like, what are the sources of Canadian constitutional law? When were they adopted? And sort of what do they look like? So the, the two major constitutional sources are what we now call the Constitution Act 1867, which started its life as the British North America Act, 1867. So that's, uh, as the name gives you a clue that it's a statute that was enacted by the, uh, we call the Imperial Parliament, it's the Parliament of the United Kingdom, wearing its uh, hat as the legislator for the British Empire in the middle of the 19th century. And the other major source is the Constitution Act, 1982, which has a complicated enactment story. Uh, it's technically an, uh, a schedule to an act of the UK Parliament because only the UK Parliament could amend its prior enactments. But it's uh, fundamentally, it's a constitutional statute that was uh, designed in Canada, as indeed, for the most part, was the 1867 one. But the 1982 one was uh, was meant to bring the constitution home to patriot it, as we say. So it was uh, uh, really the the one that made Canada into a constitutionally independent statute as well, and it could be amended going forward within Canada uh, without the need to go back to the UK. So the 1867 one for the most important thing that it does is it uh, sets out the uh, federal division of powers and it sets out the institutions of the, the federal government. So it's similar to the U.S. Constitution in that sense, except that it, uh, it is different in that it, it sets out explicitly the powers both of the federal parliament, similar to what Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution does, but it also sets out the uh, powers of the uh, provincial legislatures. So the two are uh, laid out side by side. The 1982 one does two very important things, as well as some others, but the, the two main features of it is that it um, contains the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which uh, is more or less equivalent to the uh, Bill of Rights and say the uh, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, uh, and some of the others. And it contains the, the amending formula that tells you how the Canadian Constitution is to be amended. So those are the two main constitutional texts. There are a few others, but, but those are the big ones. In addition to that, the Canadian Constitution also consists of unwritten principles, which the Supreme Court has said have a normative force and has based at least some of its decisions on them, although it's also made contradictory statements about their import and significance. The Canadian Constitution also includes rules that are known as conventions, uh, which are rules that originate in political practice which are binding on political actors, uh, be they the governor general, ministers, and so on, uh, but which on the orthodox view are not actually legal rules and the courts will not enforce them, although they can sometimes declare them uh, 
I'm not sure it, how much sense it makes, but but that's the standard view of of this thing. So yeah, there is this multiplicity of sources, but the the written sources are primarily the 1867 and 1982 Constitution Acts. So what institutional body is the ultimate interpreter of Canadian constitutional law? And has that body been consistent over time? The the interpreter of the Canadian Constitution is the Supreme Court, uh, as in the United States. Uh, until 1949, they were not actually the Supreme Court. And the uh, there, there was another body that was sitting above the Supreme Court of Canada in the uh, constitutional, in the, in the judicial hierarchy, and that was the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is uh, formally part of the UK government. Uh, in reality, by convention, it was uh, staffed by the same uh, j judges who were also members of the uh, Judicial Committee of the House of Lords. So they were the highest judges of the United Kingdom. And one of the things they did was they sat on appeals from colonial, uh, colonial judgments, including the judgments of the Canadian courts. So they were, the, the, they were technically not a court, but in reality, they were the court of last resort for Canada as well as for, at the time, places like Australia, New Zealand, uh, and others. Okay. Okay. So what then is sort of the prevailing view today of how the Canadian constitution is supposed to be interpreted? The prevailing view is that the Canadian constitution is a living tree and that metaphor comes from an opinion of the Privy Council in a case known as the person's case. So the Canadian constitution is a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits said the Privy Council. The natural limits part is sometimes forgotten by people who expound this view. Uh, so the idea is that the constitution should be able to adapt to social changes and to the shifting and developing needs and values of society as it uh, grows and uh, changes. So if you were to characterize sort of the way that Canadian constitutional law lawyers and scholars typically think about the relationship between the text of the documents that make up the Canadian constitution or con uh, constitutional laws and the sort of way that they're interpreted, how, how would you characterize the sort of conventional understanding of that relationship? So it's difficult to say because as uh, especially Benjamin Oliphant and I said in, in uh, some of those papers that we were looking at, the Canadian Supreme Court uh, and other courts have been very eclectic in how they approach the Constitution. So there is not a single clear-cut answer to that question. But I would say that if you have to give one answer, what the Canadian lawyers would say is that the text is important, we have to look at the text, but the text can be given the meaning that is uh, most suitable to the needs of the, uh, the needs and the values also of contemporary society. Right. And my understanding is like you, you mentioned the person's case and you talked about a couple other cases decided by the Supreme Court or other judicial bodies sort of getting at the conceptual relationship between the constitution and the interpretive process. Sort of how was that described in those cases. And it, I mean, it seemed to me that you suggest that there's sort of maybe some problems with the conventional reading, or at least the strong version of the conventional reading. Right. So in, in the person, the person's case, we have this neat flourish that says the Canadian constitution is a living tree. 
Uh, we have some other cases like the uh, Motor Vehicle Act reference from 1985, which is one of the early cases uh, interpreting the Canadian Charter, which was uh, brought in in 1982. And in the Motor Vehicle reference, the, the question was asked about the relevance of the views of some of the people who actually helped uh, draft the Charter. And the Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to pay too much attention to that. Uh, the idea is that society changes, society develops, society develops more uh, progressive views about what rights are. Uh, so the person's case involved the interpretation of a provision in the 1867 Constitution Act that says the uh, that qualified persons can be summoned to sit in the Senate Canada has an appointed Senate, so this, this is what this provision is about, who can be appointed for qualified persons. And does that include women who otherwise include who otherwise meet the qualifications, or does it not? And the, the way this case is usually seen is that the uh, curmudgeonly benighted Supreme Court of Canada said, well, no, women aren't persons, and the enlightened and progressive uh, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council said, no, 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 uh, you know, this is a, bar a barbaric view, and actually women are persons, uh, so get on with the program. I don't think this is what the uh, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council actually said, and that's also the epiphany that a number of other people who... Uh, sometimes read carefully this case very late and perhaps later in their careers than they should, uh, they, you know, they tend to accept the received wisdom about what it did. Um, in the words of our former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, the way she put it is, oh, the Supreme Court, the, the Privy Council decided to grow a new branch to the living tree. Actually, if you read the decision carefully, it's a very... Uh, orthodox and careful case of statutory interpretation and they look at how the word persons is used. They say the word persons could refer to only men, but it could also refer to both men and women. So we have to look at how it's actually used in this statute, in other contemporary statutes. And given all that, they conclude that it could, in fact, be used in the uh, broader sense, in the sense that includes women and the reference to social evolution and that sort of thing is at most a tiebreaker as between those two possible meanings. Uh, so that's why the person's case, I think, is, is often misread as uh, standing for the view that the meaning of constitutional words can change. It's not what the uh, Privy Council says then, uh, and some other cases which also say, well, we don't do uh, frozen concepts. That's a phrase that comes up in a number of cases. Uh, we don't want our constitutional law to be fixed. Fair enough. But that's also not what originalists want. If you read originalist scholarship as it has developed in the last 30 years, originalism doesn't say that constitutional law has to be fixed. It does say that the meaning of the words is fixed, but it doesn't say that constitutional doctrine has to be static. And so the conventional view of Canadian judges and lawyers is that we don't want a law that would um, remain fixed for all time because that wouldn't allow the, the constitution to meet the needs of evolving society. Fair enough, but it doesn't follow from that that they need to reject regionalism. So one thing that was especially interesting uh, reading through your work from a U.S. perspective was the extent to which it seemed like a lot of Canadian justices and maybe even more so Canadian legal scholars were rejecting the idea of originalism as a valid or uh, appropriate mode of constitutional interpretation, because of course that's a 
arguably dominant or at least a very kind of strong thread in U.S. constitutional interpretation. So when that happened and when they kind of adopted this kind of anti-originalist uh, stance with respect to Canadian constitutional interpretation, what exactly were they talking about? So they, they were, this happened in the, in the late 70s and especially early 80s, especially after the, the charter came in. And uh, there was a, a previous rights protecting instrument, the Canadian Bill of Rights, which was not a constitutional, not an entrenched constitutional law. It was just a, an act of the federal parliament. And there was a widespread sense that it was stunted by a very narrow judicial interpretation. So that was probably one reason why when the charter was brought in, the court, uh, the Supreme Court was eager to adopt a different interpretive posture. Uh, they didn't want to do the same thing to the charter that they had done to the Bill of Rights. Uh, but they were also rejecting and you know, reacting against, perhaps rejecting what was developing uh, in the United States is the, the early days of contemporary originalism, which was identifiably right-leaning, identifiably opposed to the more expansionist rulings of the Warren Court and the uh, Burger Court. Uh, so that was a view that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, should be interpreted in accordance with the uh, intentions, uh, with the intent of the framers. Uh, but it was also a view that had a pretty clear political valence. Um, and it's a view that uh, was criticized by scholars as well as uh, not just on political grounds, but also on uh, intellectual grounds in the United States, uh, as well as in Canada to some extent. Uh, and originalism in the United States changed a lot in response to, to those criticisms, started, starting with uh, Justice Scalia, who was uh, an early forebear of the new originalism. Uh, but Canada didn't really take notice of those uh, developments that occurred starting in the, let's say, little, the late 80s in the US. And so when Canadian judges and scholars say that oh, well, we don't do originalism here to this day, they are responding against what originalism perhaps was like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I definitely got the sense from, from your papers that there was this sort of almost like a caricature, like a sort of crude originalist theory that was rejected without sort of a sensitivity to how understandings had changed over time. But maybe, you know, for listeners who might not even be that familiar with kind of originalist constitutional interpretation theory in the U.S., sort of could you, could you briefly characterize those changes? Sort of what was the interpretive shift that took place within originalist theory that makes the sort of version of original that's been rejected in in Canadian legal scholarship no longer congruent with what contemporary originalist theory looks like? So for one thing, there is a, a shift of emphasis uh, away from the subjective intentions of the people who uh, helped frame the constitutional text. Uh, the reason for that is that for one thing, it's, it's often difficult to, to understand what the intentions of individuals were a long time ago. Uh, they might not have left us with very good evidence. Uh, they might also have had conflicting intentions because uh, the Constitution is not just the work of, of one person in the way, let's say, a novel might be the, the work of just one author. Uh, and, and in any case, uh, from a rule of law standpoint, the subjective intentions are not what was actually enacted. Uh, and so they are not what provides guidance to people who have to comply with this law. So the, the emphasis uh, now differs depending on, on who you ask. And there is a great variety of uh, originalist schools of thought. Uh, but perhaps the, the leading one 
stresses now the importance of the original meaning of the Constitution, specifically the, the original public meaning of the Constitution. Uh, so the, the question is, what would the words of the Constitution have meant to the public at the time that it, when it was enacted? Now, there is a recognition which was probably absent in the early days of, of originalism that the original meaning of the words is not going to settle all the constitutional questions and you need to, the courts will need to develop constitutional doctrine to perhaps carry out and give effect as best they can to that original meaning. Uh, but that opens up a space for uh, perhaps adopting the doctrine or certainly applying those rules to realities that were not foreseen and perhaps were not foreseeable at the time when the constitution was framed. So certainly the world in which we live now is very different from that of 1789 or it's very different from that of 1867 or even 1982. But that doesn't mean, as perhaps might have been suggested earlier, that the original meaning of the constitution just is, is useless. It's not enough to answer some questions. It's enough to answer some. It's not enough to answer others. Uh, but it's certainly not irrelevant, as some of the uh, critics of originalism might uh, suggest. Right. So in, 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 in your paper, you, you lay out some examples of... Canadian constitutional decisions that seem arguably consistent with the more contemporary theory of of originalism, or at least not inconsistent <laughs> with a contemporary theory of originalism. Uh, it might be helpful if you could like kind of point to a couple of those examples and sort of walk us through how how they work and what sort of an, an originalist take on the interpretation would be. Sure. So I, I just want to stress that those uh, those papers uh, where I do that, they're co-authored uh, with uh, Benjamin Oliphant, and uh, I just want to make sure that uh, he's also getting credit for that. Um, so there there is there there is a fairly large number of cases, uh, but maybe just a few uh, very salient ones uh, to to give a flavor. So there is a couple of cases that perhaps really helped set us on this uh, inquiry and, and not just us. I think those were cases that uh, gave a, a new uh, impetus to thinking about originalism to a number of Canadian uh, scholars, lawyers, uh, to opinions uh, given by the Supreme Court in 2014, uh, opinions not decisions because they are, uh, unlike in the United States, the Supreme Court can actually, the Supreme Court of Canada can actually give advisory opinions, and that's what uh, those were. So one concerned the appointment of a judge to a seat that is uh, reserved to Quebec uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, so this is a judge who had to come from, had to be a former Quebec lawyer. Uh, and the particular person who was appointed had been a judge on the Federal Court of Canada rather than one of the courts in Quebec. And the question was whether that disqualified him from being appointed to one of the Quebec seats. And what the uh, majority of the Supreme Court did to, uh, when they answered that and they said, actually, yeah, he was disqualified, they looked... Uh, in considerable detail at the debates around the enactment of the legislation that set up the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, those debates in uh, 1875, uh, and then they looked at other debates uh, that happened in the 1980, in the, uh, in the 1980s, uh, before the enactment of the 1982 Constitution Act uh, to uh, see what uh, was the, the purpose of the provisions that mentioned the Supreme Court in that uh, constitutional text. And it was largely based on, on that, that they answered the, the questions in that, uh, in, in that advisory opinion that they gave. Uh, and they, they were really trying 
by my lights and by I think the, the the way that a lot of people read that decision is that they were really trying to carry out the intentions of the parties to that agreement. Another another opinion that they gave around the same time uh, had to do with proposed reforms to the Canadian Senate, and again they were looking at the. Uh, debates that uh, predated the enactment of the 1867 Constitutional Act. Uh, they were looking at what were the framers of that act trying to achieve, what did they think the Senate would be like, uh, and that factored to a considerable extent into their decision. So those were two uh, very salient cases where the court was not asking, well, how would it what's the best Supreme Court that we can have today? Would it suit the needs of contemporary society to have former federal court judges sitting on the Quebec seats? Would it suit the needs of contemporary society or the values of contemporary society to have uh, the Senate reformed in the way that was uh, proposed for the court's consideration? They were asking, what would the people back in 1867 or back in 1875 or back in 1982, what would they make of those reforms? So that those were largely, I would say, originalist decisions. Uh, and just one more example, that's a case from, I think, 2015, a case called Caron, uh, that had to do with whether, the, uh, whether French could be removed uh, as uh, an official language of uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And that uh, was based on the interpretation of a constitutional text that was enacted in the 1870s, uh, which guaranteed legal rights to the inhabitants of the territories uh, from which those provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, were eventually created. And so the question is, well, does the phrase legal rights encompass linguistic rights? And the, uh, the two opinions in, uh, in that case were both originalist. The dissenting opinion looked to the intentions, what it took to be the intentions of the parties, but specifically with a focus on the intentions of the representatives of those territories, uh, rather than the representatives of the Canadian government. And they said, well, their intention would have been to protect their linguistic rights. The majority looked at the uh, meaning of the phrase legal rights at the time, not in 2015, but in 1870. Uh, and they concluded that uh, whatever public you, you look at, whether you look to, to the lawyers or to legislators or, or whoever the relevant public is, they would not have understood the, the phrase legal rights to encompass linguistic rights. Uh, so as I see it, two originalist decisions, the dissent went for in, original intent, the majority went for public meaning, I think the majority was right, but both decisions, again, it wasn't about what the contemporary reading of legal rights would be or what uh, contemporary society would think would be the best reading uh, of legal rights or would we want to protect the legal rights of, uh, or do we want to protect the linguistic rights of uh, the inhabitants of those provinces? No, they were looking at what happened back in 1870 and that was the, the basis on which they decided the case. So, Leonard, one of the things I thought was really interesting about your paper was it kind of struck me that irrespective of what your normative position on what the appropriate method of constitutional interpretation under the Canadian Constitution should be, as a practical matter, it seems like you sort of identify ways in which the Canadian Supreme Court is, in fact, engaging in at least some form of originalist interpretation, whether or not it recognizes it. And I wonder if you think that's a problem. I mean, does it, is, are there potential weaknesses to engaging in this interpretive method without being candid or recognizing that that's the interpretive method that's actually being deployed? Sure. So 
The and yeah, just to preface that by saying that uh, those uh, two papers that I uh, co-wrote with uh, Ben Oliphant, we were really trying hard not to take a normative position on what the uh, improper interpretive method should be. Now, I've moved on from from that uh, caution. I'm not sure that uh, Ben has, so I'm not going to speak for him. Uh, but we do think that whether or not you think that originalism should be part of uh, how we interpret the constitution or maybe it should be the whole thing or you disagree and you think that it should be relegated to you know, the ash heap of history uh, yeah there is a problem with just doing it from time to time not saying that you're doing it and not thinking about it and the problem is fundamentally that you you never know what to expect from the supreme court so if uh, if it becomes very hard to tell what is and what is not constitutional because you don't know how the Supreme Court is going to approach the Constitution in any given case. So it's difficult for lawyers to, to predict what they need to do. It's difficult for governments to, to know whether uh, their legislative plans will be uh, upset by a Supreme Court that decided to lurch in one direction or the other. So we have this uh, unpredictable constitutional doctrine that uh, is an issue from a rule of law standpoint. And the other problem that uh, we identify is is that if you engage in originalist interpretation surreptitiously without admitting to anyone, including yourself, that you're actually doing it, chances are you're going to do it badly. So, for example, we get cases like the ones I just described uh, on the Supreme Court, on the Senate reform, uh, on the Caron case, where judges uh, focus quite a lot on original intentions, or at least some of them focus on original intentions. But there is no real thought being given to the the issues that have been identified with uh, an originalism that focuses on intentions. in the Cajon case, there is no thought being given to, well, why do the intentions of, of this set of parties rather than the other set of parties, uh, you know, why should we look to that? Uh, so the court ends up doing originalism, but it, it does it less well than it uh, would, we think, if uh, it did it candidly and received a good argument from counsel uh, based on the expectation that this is uh, what should be on the table. So counsel are going to argue uh, using the language of uh, evolving living constitutionalist interpretations, but actually then under that same heading, they will appeal to the original intentions or perhaps original meaning. Uh, so there is um, there's a lack of transparency on the one hand, there is a lack of guidance on the other uh, and, and there is also a lack of um, intellectual clarity, and, and as a result, uh, the quality of what the court does and what the advocates before the court do uh, is bound to suffer. So, yeah, that is great. That's I totally couldn't agree more, um, and it's really compelling. And, and I wonder if. In closing, you could spend a few minutes sort of talking about your own work, sort of pushing these ideas forward and talking about maybe why the Canadian Supreme Court and kind of Canada in general maybe should like arguably like stop worrying and maybe embrace originalism to some degree or at least in some ways. Like in what ways do you think that that would be beneficial potentially? to Canadian constitutional interpretation and to kind of Canadian law and politics in general? Sure. So I think that originalism generally is uh, more consistent with the requirements of the rule of law than the alternatives. Uh, The law is supposed to be public stable and it's supposed to be uh, subject to change uh, only through procedures that are also public, accessible, and known in advance. And originalism helps achieve that in relation to constitutional law uh, 
in a way that living constitutionalism that in effect delegates the power of constitutional amendment to the Supreme Court to be deployed uh, on a case by case basis and quite unpredictably uh, does not. So uh, I think that's, that's the main argument for originalism, the rule of law argument. There's also relatedly a democratic argument, uh, constitutional amendment under the Canadian constitution is uh, supposed to involve uh, federal parliament and the legislatures of uh, provinces. The number will vary depending on the nature of the amendment uh, in question. So that's a democratic process. Uh, the amendment of the constitution by the Supreme Court is not a very democratic process at all. Uh, but more fundamentally, I think the, the rule of law is uh, an even more important argument. Uh, so that that's that's one reason why I think, uh, and I'm only speaking for myself, uh, originalist interpretation would be preferable. I think originalist interpretation, if we all agreed, and admittedly that's a very big if, but if we all agreed that uh, originalism is the way to interpret the Constitution, uh, the political stakes of Supreme Court appointments would be lower now. Supreme Court appointments in Canada are nothing like those in the United States. There is a number of reasons for that. One of them is that people haven't really realized how important the identity of Supreme Court judges are. In part, that's due to the fact that uh, judges have an enormous amount of leeway because they uh, claim, at least, that they will interpret the Constitution as a living document, so they can change the, the import of the Constitution. And so it matters who is doing the changing. Uh, if judges accepted that they cannot change the meaning of the words, that would reduce the, the power of the court and that would reduce the stakes of who gets to appoint the judges and who specifically gets appointed to the court. Uh, so that's another reason. And then, then there's the fact that Contrary to what uh, Canadians certainly seem to believe, originalism is not necessarily going to lead to narrower or more constricted interpretations of constitutional rights. In fact, it might uh, be just the other way around. So I have some examples in this uh, short paper that comments on uh, Professor Solom's uh, statement to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, in relation to the nomination of uh, then Judge Gorsuch. Uh, and, and I point out that there are some examples uh, of, of cases, uh, structural cases and charter cases alike, uh, when a living constitutionalist approach to the uh, Canadian Constitution will actually uh, produce uh, outcomes that are less favorable to individual rights or to vulnerable people in Canada. So one of those is, uh, is an old case where the question was whether a province could uh, ban what they called communistic propaganda. And under the Canadian constitution, criminal law is a federal power. So the, the argument on uh, the other side was that banning ideas was a criminal law, uh, an instance of criminal law. Uh, and so only fed the federal parliament could do that. And they hadn't done it because the federal parliament had historically been more solicitous, I guess, of um, freedom of expression, even that's even before the enactment of the Canadian charter. And the, the judge who dissented in that case, Justice Tashou, was made a very explicit appeal to uh, the needs of present day societies. This is 1950s, this is the, the Red Scare is uh, in full swing. And uh, Justice Tashou says, you know, we know that uh, those communists are at work trying to overthrow our government. Uh, and so we need to adjust the way we see the constitution to give the, the province the power to deal with that. The majority didn't follow along, and so that that the majority's decision was much more consistent with originalism. It was more protective of rights. And another example is uh, maybe the most recent one's uh, decision in a case called Como uh, on the provision in the uh, 1867 Constitution that is uh, was meant to ensure internal free trade in Canada. 
has been widely disregarded. The provinces has been allowed have been allowed to uh, erect all kinds of crazy uh, barriers to to trade, and we know that those barriers to internal trade within Canada. Uh, cost people uh, tremendous amounts of money. They cost the economy a lot of money. Uh, our GDP could be much higher if those barriers weren't there. But we also know that those barriers have a particular effect on the poorest families. They hit the poorest families hardest. So that's an instance where sticking to the original meaning of the Constitution would have uh, protected the pocketbooks of especially the most vulnerable Canadians. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't do that. They said uh, that, no, it's more important to give the, the provinces the power to regulate as they see fit. So they based the decision on what they thought were the uh, needs and desires of contemporary society. But they privilege in, in that way, they privilege a particular subset of contemporary society, namely the legislators who want to have more powers to engage in protectionist regulation. Uh, at the expense of another subset of society, namely the people who are going to pay for all this protectionist regulation, uh, especially the, the poorest and most vulnerable people. Uh, and, and I don't think that a court has the mandate to do that. Now, if the Constitution allowed this to be done, then, well, then the court wouldn't have anything to say on that subject, and perhaps it would need to look at changing the Constitution. But as it happens, the Constitution stood in the way or ought to have stood in the way of this sort of, uh, of policy. And the Supreme Court said, well, well, no, we, we think that we know better than the people who wrote the Constitution uh, what society needs. I don't think that uh, on the one hand, it's uh, from, a, again, from a rule of law standpoint, it's not particularly uh, appropriate for them to, to be rewriting the Constitution in this way. Uh, but also from a democratic standpoint, they are not the ones to whom the mandate to balance political interests has been given in this way. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really, I mean, it's a very compelling argument. And uh, it's been just fascinating to read about and hear about sort of constitutional interpretation in a similar, but in many ways, really different uh, a system. So, Leonard, th thanks so much for coming on the show today. I really learned a lot about Canadian constitutional law talking to you. Thanks, thanks for having me, Brian. It was a pleasure. Dear Canada, I'm writing this letter to thank you for helping them six Americans in Iran. I'm not the only one writing you a letter. All my friends are too. Oh yeah, I, I almost forgot. My name is Shelly. I'm eight years old. Today, it seems like all Americans are smiling because of what you did. Just when it seemed like we didn't have any friends, there you were. My brother was in the army. He called home and said Canada was a good friend. And in this bad time, we need all our friends. I never visited your country, but maybe someday I will. I've seen pictures of it, and it's beautiful. And I do love hockey. I don't know why that man with the beard doesn't like us, but I'm glad you do. Uh-oh, I have to go now, because my mom's calling me for dinner. And I have homework to do. Well, tonight when I go to bed, I'll pray to God that he will bless you for what you did. P.S. Canada, you have a special place in my heart, in my country, sir. Love, Shelly.